Everybody is here. We can start. So it's my pleasure to present here Jean Lasseg. Jean Lasseg is a uh, well. I know Jean Lasseg from. <laughs> You know, I think it's the first time that we met it was maybe 30 years ago or 35 years ago. <laughs> well, and so <laughs> we were doctorate students together. <laughs> and so Jean Lasseg is research director now at CNRS. He worked on uh, Alan, Alan Turing, so Turing machine, continuity, um, thematic of continuity. And uh, he also wrote a book on Cassirer and semiotic anthropology. And now he's interested on the topic of di digitalization of, of law and science of laws. And so, uh, please. Thank you. Um, so, um, my talk today uh, is called How to do science with words, uh, a tribute to Judith Longo's work. And so, I will try first to make sense of, of what I gather from, uh, from uh, Giuseppe's work. Of course, there are many ways to, to present uh, his uh, thoughts and, and work, um, and we've been discussing so far many of them uh, since yesterday. Um, so I would like to have some kind of philosophical point of view uh, that could help reveal uh, uh, the coherence uh, of these various contributions. Of course, there are several ways I could uh, make use of. Uh, the first one would be just to to describe uh, Giuseppe's work uh, according to the various disciplines that he contributed to, like you know, mathematical logic, theoretical biology, philosophy of science, all the social sciences. But of course, um, this would certainly shed light on, on, on uh, various aspects of, of his thinking, but not of the mutual coherence of, of these various directions. So I think I, I would try something else. I could also say, well, you know, uh, Giuseppe had many interests, uh, in, so it would be some kind of psychological approach, and of course, um, uh, we can make sense of, of, of his work by saying, well, he was interested first in, in, in computation, and from there, you know, he would uh, drift uh, to philosophy of science, uh, and, and then to the social sciences. But I don't think it's, it's the right, right way to present things, because first, uh, um, yeah, theoretical biology would, would, um, would not be mentioned, it would be, and I think it would overlook uh, one of the most interesting part of his work, which is theoretical biology. So Ugh. there must be some other ways. Um, we can also imagine, just to use some kind of temporal description, you know, where he started from and where he is up to now, but I, I think that I would use something slightly different, and um, I would just mention um, um, my first interaction with Giuseppe, and I will start with this, um, and I hope that uh, yeah, from there you will, um, I can I can shed light on, on some kind of what I consider uh, a coherent path of uh, his intellectual life. So um, first, I, I followed Giuseppe's lectures on mathematical mathematical logic. Uh, when I was doing my master's degree here in cognitive science, and that was in 1991, I think. Uh, some of you might not even have been born at that time. Um, anyway, um, then I, I thought that maybe uh, as a philosopher, I, I could start my PhD thesis in philosophy uh, about computability and, and uh, related topics. And that's eventually what I did in the following years um, by focusing on Turing's model of computation. But I think I have to remind you uh, um, what was the atmosphere in the 90s um, uh, because it was the crazy time when computers were supposed to prove interesting mathematical theorems by themselves. Mm. You know, uh, this, this was the kind of ideology we, we were in. 
So as, uh, as a philosopher nurtured by, by the Kantian and Neo-Kantian tradition, uh, I, I was particularly shocked by that. Um, and, you know, and by this kind of bragging. Uh, so how was it that, that philosophers would, would follow up this kind of, this kind of, uh, uh, of thing? So uh, at that time I was uh, reading Turing and uh, most, more specifically the inner limitation of computation in his 1936 theorem. So I, I was yeah, very puzzled, and you were too actually at that time. Um, so, uh, so I remember one day that uh, I went to, to visit uh, Giuseppe here at the uh, when, when you had when you had your office uh, in the uh, Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, which is not existing anymore, um, which is a shame. Uh, and I, I, told, I told you about this discontent of mine, and you said to me, don't feel guilty of thinking what you think. And I, I think that was some kind of, of uh, emancipation. Uh, <laughs> And so, you know, I tell the young here that, I mean, don't feel guilty uh, of thinking what you think. It's, it's always uh, good to stick to what you think. So, um, well, you know, I, I uh, in a way, overcame my own weaknesses and maybe managed to write a book on Turing um, that I, I gave you a copy in 1998. And then we started some kind of uh, collaboration, the two of us. Uh, we organized various workshops and things. And uh, Giuseppe, you were also uh, the founding father of my own seminar here at uh, UNS, which is called Fall Assembly, uh, which has to do with af um, yeah, anthropology, semiotic anthropology, but also epistemology, since you gave several talks there. So I think it's, it's around that time that I had a very strange idea uh, but maybe not so strange uh, when you think about it. And, and this idea was that there was a parallel to make between Turing's intellectual development and yours. Uh, and why is that? Well, because I think that uh, these two persons both started with the same interest in computability, transforming the same peer interest in computer science, and then the same interest in philosophy of science, and also the same interest in theoretical biology. And, and of course, uh, this is a part of Turing's work that was mm. uh, often put aside, and to say the least, uh, although you consider, and I consider too, that it's central to the understanding of the role of computation. It couldn't just be uh, chance that, that this parallel was even thinkable. So, uh, in a way, I can say that Turing's directions of work helped me understand uh, Giuseppe's, which is something interesting. So, in this talk now, uh, I am now struggling with yet another challenge, which is how to make sense of Turing's own intellectual journey. But at least I have, you know, uh, someone to help me, and this is uh, Giuseppe himself. So, in the various interactions that we had along the years, uh, we finally spotted one quote by Turing that inspired both of us, uh, him as, as a logician and mathematician and me as a philosopher. And this quote uh, is taken from his 19, uh, Turing's 1950 <coughs> philosophical article, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And Turing sneaks in uh, a remark that he puts in brackets in the text as if it was only a side remark. And this quote is the following, bracket, mechanism and writing are, from our point of view, almost synonymous, bracket. So it took us years, I think, to fathom uh, the consequences of this sentence, where every word is important. Uh, from a logical point of view, uh, Turing doesn't say that mechanism and writing are synonymous, but he says that they are almost synonymous. So Turing's theorem on the inner limitation of computation is entirely contained in this almost, uh, if you know how to read it, of course. So if 
mechanism and writing were synonymous, it would mean that there is no inner limitation to computation and that the Entscheidungsproblem posed by Hilbert can be answered positively, which is of course not the case. So from my point of view, the quote was important because far from taking mechanical intelligence as a theory of mind, we started with the help of another researcher, uh, our colleague and friend uh, Clarisse Herrn-Schmidt, to follow Turing's genius remark and interpret computer science as a new step in the long history of writing. So, you know, mechanical intelligence is not something that has to do with the mind, it has something to do with the social world, and more specifically, with a certain way of writing. So, understanding artificial intelligence as a new step in the history of writing was typically an object of study of the social sciences. So it wasn't the so-called naturalization of the mind, more or less confused with the brain, uh, which was the center of attention, but the very long social history. So it was not the mind, whatever that mean, I don't think it's, it's even translatable in another language, that was the main frame of investigation then. What mainstream cognitive science would put in the mind-brain in the so-called naturalized investigation um, was in fact a millennia-long social process. And so without guilt, uh, you know, following um, your advice, Giuseppe, we could then use the toolbox of social scientists to understand this quote and this toolbox is, of course, has to do with history, with anthropology, and with philosophy. The second consequence of, of, this, uh, of this quote was that the water, watertight distinction between objective and human sciences was completely blown up. Computation, as a logical concept, has to do with science which are the most human institution we can think of. So more precisely, computation, as defined by Turing, and others of course, was the result of a formal manipulation of only written tokens. And this formal manipulation had a very long history that could be traced back to the invention of the alphabet. I won't dwell about this this time, but I mean, we can talk about that. So maybe Giuseppe uh, doesn't know that uh, as a specialist of computability theory, he was in fact a social scientist. <laughs> uh, and so was Turing, by the way. So uh, that's an important uh, point to make. Um, and the third consequence uh, I can think of uh, reflecting on, on this quote was that I could also defend um, this somehow weird parallel between Turing and Giuseppe's intellectual journey, um, I, I, could, I could see that these two uh, journeys could be described as an investigation in the concept of writing. And more precisely, they started with the same formal constraint on, on writing, limited to uh, written tokens, devoid of any meaning, so that's the Hilbertian talk, um, take on, 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 uh, on writing, and then if you, uh, if you relax this constraint, well, if it's partly, partly removed, uh, you, can, you can go from, from strict formalism to informatics and to morphogenetics. So, in fact, the way I see these uh, intellectual careers is starting with formal writing at the beginning, relaxing this constraint, and see what happens. You know, and, and I think it, it, it gives a pretty good description of, of uh, at least coherent uh, way of uh, describing uh, what you did, uh, Giuseppe. 
So the first article Giuseppe and me uh, wrote together it was called What is Turing Comparison Between Mechanism and Writing Worth? So it was a, a commentary in some kind of sense of, of this uh, quote by Turing that I mentioned earlier. And the, uh, the paper was uh, presented at the Centennial uh, Conference in Cambridge celebrating Turing's birth. That was in 2012. And uh, there was no echo whatsoever of this, of this article. Um, but of course, I have, I have to mention the fact that uh, the conference, uh, the, the subtitle of the conference was How the World Computes. And of course, this was an, an idea that uh, Giuseppe and I completely uh, rejected as totally uh, misconceived. So no wonder uh, that uh, we didn't have uh, any uh, echo uh, when we wrote this text. So we claimed something else on the contrary. We claimed that the computation was not in nature, but was a very elaborate cultural institution that took millennia uh, to be uh, formed. And we also claimed that science couldn't be limited to writing processes. So there was more in words and in symbolic interactions among humans than what writing could deal with. And precisely because mechanism and writing were only almost synonymous. Mm. So now uh, I would like to spend a few minutes uh, exploring this graphical constraint and you know how to make sense of it. And I, I don't have uh, time to deal with the exploration uh, from the point of view of philosophy of science per se, uh, because I want to stick to uh, the theme of this panel, which is interface with humanities. But as far as I know, uh, Giuseppe was the first one to locate the concept of computation within the overall picture of the historical steps of determinism since the 18th century. So um, I was very impressed by the way he could make some parallel between physics and logic, both in classical determinism and in modern determinism. His idea was, was that Laplace predictive determinism had some kind of echo in Hilbert deductive determinism in logic, and um, in the same way, uh, Poincaré's internal limitations of predictive determinism had some kind of echo in the internal limitations in deductive determinism in Gödel and Turing. So where was, uh, where could we locate uh, Turing in, in these two steps? Well, Turing, uh, strangely enough, is uh, exactly at the crossroads because his, I mean, if you think of what a computer is, it is supposed to uh, obey classical determinism in hardware, although uh, in software, of course, it is uh, limited to, because of the internal limitations um, that, that he described in computation. So um, there is some kind of chart, you know, uh, with uh, um, two steps, and, and Turing, in a way, um, makes sense of both of them. Um, and, um, of course, this chart can be seen as a philosophy of science pure, but uh, uh, in the interpretation that uh, Clarice, uh, Giuseppe and me, uh, we had already uh, started to put into place at that time, uh, the chart could also be seen as ways of relaxing this graphical constraint by introducing semantics into the picture. So, I think this is a, a way of uh, understanding uh, um, this, this scientific evolution. So many phenomena, either in the objective or in the human sciences, cannot be adequately grasped if we stick to syntactic computation only. So what are they? Um, many of you know that Giuseppe often uses the example of the double pendulum that cannot be adequately modelized on a computer uh, because the movement of the double pendulum can start again on exactly the same position 
which has no meaning in the physical space as far as um, the difference in, in, in positions are concerned. Um, on the contrary, uh, the, the computer model can start with exactly the same value corresponding to the same physical position, making the world some kind of fairy tale of predictive deterministic processes, which is of course not the case. But I think I would give other examples that are not borrowed from uh, natural sciences, but from humanities, since this is a theme of, of, uh, uh, of this afternoon. And more precisely, I will uh, say a little bit about my own work on the digitization of law, uh, because uh, in this area too, it is also quite clear that written procedures cannot replace the confrontation in court between parties in conflict, mm. if only because testimonies need to be reported by individuals mm. through spoken words. Mm -hmm. So the digitization of law has been going on for quite some time, at least since the 60s, and I will first recall a few historical steps that says a lot about the problem of the relationship between digital and classical uh, judicial procedures. So the first step is very simple. Uh, digitization of law was first considered as some kind of augmented stationary. So court of justice would be equipped with computers, sometimes interconnected through secured networks, Relationships with the various parties involved could be made paperless and uh, laws voted in parliaments would be accessible to the general public uh, via dedicated websites like Légis France here in France. So the aim was essentially to gain productivity by limiting paperwork. And I will quote um, an Estonian official at the uh, Estonian Ministry of Justice who wraps up exactly this. And she's called Annette Numa, and she says, if the cooperation between different sectors is strong and healthy, technological solutions could minimize the amount of paperwork, provide a more reliable and comprehensive overview of all relevant pieces of information across state registries, and of course, reduce the red tape between courts and citizens. These solutions save time and money, both for the citizen and public officials. But this is only the first step of digitization, and it doesn't stop there. The second step, uh, I would say around the, uh, the turn of the century, was different. Legality was also partially transferred to software, which was supposed to be trusted just like other legal instruments, although it had lost completely any clear certification from a legal authority on the way. Um, Lawrence Lessig, so an American law professor, wrapped that up in, in, in a motto. He said, code is law. Not law is code, but code is law. So. This involves uh, many difficulties as far as law is understood and, and recognized as the decisive authority. And why is that? Well, because software is now a normative instance, although it's not read readable as a legal text. Um, and, and of course, uh, this, is, this is a great challenge. I mean, you can't ask judges to be computer scientists, so if they have to use these software, they have to trust them. But there is no way of um, making sure that, that these software do what they do. So we, we have here the, the big, big uh, problems. Um, the problem is, uh, at least in my view, uh, that uh, we are completely illiterate as far as coding is concerned. And of course, you can't expect judges to, to become computer scientists, as I just said. Uh, they have plenty of work, uh, so you can't expect that. So, um, if we can't read the law anymore, and sometimes even we don't even write it, 
How can we make use of it? So law, as the theory of social normativity, is now replaced by software use. But of course, lines of code do not pertain to the three-dimensional verbal space uh, of a court. They are dematerialized tokens, and they are not meant to be read in any sense. Pieces of software do not suppose a space of interlocution contrary to legal texts written in natural languages. And of course, the compulsory force of logical entailment does not derive from a legal corpus of texts. And last but not least, we said that at lunchtime, um, pieces of software are mostly pri private products protected by copyright laws. So the content of which may not be disclosed. So we have to trust them because we just can't have a look at it in, inside in a way. But you could, you could think, well, that's, that's, that's enough. Well, it's not enough. There are new ways of doing justice. And there's a third step, which is even more controversial. And this third step is about blockchain justice that seek to bypass software use. So there are now networks and uh, legal decisions that, uh, that are starting to be carried out on completely private networks using these blockchain protocols, making use of smart contracts that are automatically executed without any human intervention. And it's based on three principles. First, decentralization, there is no central governance. Immutability, there is no modification of blocks. And pseudonymity, no personal identities are involved. And so I think this is a radical step, in, a step in, in, the, in the writing schema that I was talking about. Because it is a totally written protocol where nobody actually meets anybody and where the appeal process itself uses jurors scattered around the world who participate in trials to make money and not to uh, exerce uh, 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 their own uh, judgment. So it is now game theory, theory rather than law which becomes the norm. And I think this is, uh, of course, very preoccupying. So these new digitalized ways of doing justice pose uh, to me intrinsic problems that can be addressed both epistemologically and semiotically. So if we go back to epistemology, um, the use of blockchain technology relies on trustless, automatic protocols. So in a way, I think it can be related to predictive determinism in on-chain information processing. And, and of course, we know that that's not the last word of um, determinism. So blockchain need to be deterministic in the sense of predictive determinism in order to be secure. But uh, the problem is that, uh, of course, uh, these smart contracts uh, also need external information from the outside world in order uh, to work. So there is, there is, of course, an interface between out, uh, the outside world and the inside world. And it's, 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 of course, there that, uh, that um, predictive determinism is, is not enough. So they use uh, uh, a notion that comes directly from Turing, uh, from his PhD of 1938. They use the notion of an oracle. And in, in, in these circles, an oracle is defined this way. An oracle is a bridge between the blockchain and the outside world. They act as on-chain, uh, um, where you can query to get information into your smart contracts. This could be anything from price information to weather reports. Oracles can also be bi-directional, used to send data out to the real world. But as we all know, a computability theory encompasses both computable and non-computable processes. So it doesn't offer any guarantee that predictive determinism can be maintained in blockchains where 
computable seems to be identified with decidable. And that's, of course, a big problem. My last point will be that uh, to, uh, we, we can also make some, some semiotic remarks about, about this last step in, in, uh, in the judicial uh, process. Um, um, I, I want to, to quote here um, uh, a remark by Catherine Becker, who is a specialist of blockchain technology in law, and she wrote a beautiful article on blockchain matters, Lex, Lex Cryptographia, Cryptographia and the Displacement of Legal, Symbolic and Imaginaries. That's in Law and Critique. It's, you can find it, find it online. And she says, each request to bridge blockchain legal system with legal systems and their overarching ideals should take into account the role of the body, language and territory i.e. those elements of human existence which are inextricably bound to interpretation, to symbolic and imaginary representation, and which therefore necessarily remain excluded from the law of blockchain. So this is where logic and meet semiotics in some kind of way, uh, as Giuseppe often uh, notices. So there's a lot to say, I think, about how to adapt computation to a shared, meaningful collectivity built by humans. So, as a conclusion, I would like just to raise one question. How do we keep doing science when computation interpreted as graphic constraint is not enough to get a better determination of phenomena we can non nonetheless grasp? So, said differently, how do we go beyond writing to account for specific phenomena science deals with? I think it implies to take shared words seriously beyond the empire of writing. Thank you. C'est Alain Supio, donc je ne prends aucune responsabilité. Et je vais essayer de bien lire son texte qui est, qui est très beau. Euh, dès les premiers jours où j'ai eu la chance de le rencontrer, j'ai soupçonné Giuseppe Longo d'être un homme venu du Quattro Cento pour sortir à la recherche scientifique des ornières où elle tend à, à s'enfoncer de nos jours. L'un de ces grands esprits de la Renaissance qui, ayant su s'arracher à la scolastique, cultivait un doute méthodique vis-à-vis -vis de tout esprit de système sans renoncer pour autant à une vue compréhensive des sciences et des arts. Tels esprits n'ont guère leur place dans l'organisation contemporaine de la recherche, marquée par l'imaginaire cybernétique et l'enfermement disciplinaire. L'imaginaire cybernétique incite à penser les hommes, les animaux et les plantes sur le modèle des machines à traiter l'information, c'est-à-dire comme des êtres programmés et programmables. Et l'enfermement disciplinaire, entravant toute incursion hors du champ d'une spécialisation de plus en plus étroitement définie, condamne à l'autoréférence ceux qui s'y résignent et à l'excommunication ceux qui s'en évadent. Ces plaies ne sont pas nouvelles, même si elles, elles se sont considérablement aggravées durant la dernière décennie. En 1974, dans un recueil intitulé « Pourquoi la mathématique ?», un collectif de savants, au premier rang desquels Alexandre Grotendick et Rotel, René Tom, appelait déjà les, <coughs> les gens de science à tourner leur regard vers ce qu'ils font, vers ce que l'on leur fait faire. Car l'Occident doit, doit prendre la peine de se voir et de ne plus se confondre avec les mythes dont il s'est masqué. » C'est une citation. Un, un demi-siècle plus tard, face à la montée des périls engendrés par notre modèle de développement, ce devoir est à l'évidence plus impérieux que jamais. Le livre de Giuseppe Longo, euh, son dernier livre qui est 
sorti ou en train de sortir ah, ouais, en, train de sortir. en train de sortir. Nous, en, nous emmène sur cette voie aussi salvatrice qu'escarpée d'une science consciente de ses limites. Il est vrai qu'il est ardu de sortir du confort de sa discipline. Tous les lecteurs qui, comme moi, n'ont pour tout bagage mathématique qu'une formation très secondaire, auront fini de s'en convaincre en lisant ce livre. Ils auraient plusieurs fois rebroussé le chemin sans le talent de Giuseppe Longo, qui prend le lecteur par la main pour lui donner au moins à entrevoir les formes escarpées de l'attitude dont il n'aurait pu, sans un tel guide, imaginer l'existence même. L'excursion en vaut la peine, car cette autre montagne mathématique irrigue depuis des siècles tous les champs du savoir. Mais aussi haut qu'on la grimpe, elle ne peut nous donner une vue complète ni de l'univers ni du monde terrestre. La reconnaissance de ses limites est, est due aux travaux de Gödel, ici mis en perspective par Giuseppe Longo, mais aussi, bien avant Gödel, à Nicolas de Cus, l'un des savants du Quattrocento tantôt évoqué. Ayant compris que face à, sa, face à un univers infini, l'homme ne pouvait acquérir par lui-même que des connaissances finies, le cousin a, promis, a promu les vertus de la docte ignorance. C'est la, la même que recommande un proverbe malien rapporté par le philosophe Amadou Ambateba. Donc, je cite « Celui qui sait qu'il ne sait pas, saura. Celui qui ne sait pas qu'il ne sait pas, ne saura pas. » À l'aube des temps modernes, cette prise de conscience des limites de nos connaissances avait ouvert au progrès scientifique un champ illimité. L'approche de, de la vérité s'annonçait pour les savants comme une tâche sans fin, tandis que la vérité absolue était l'affaire des prêtres, ou aujourd'hui des philosophes analytiques, comme j'ai entendu un jour Giuseppe Longo le suggérer malicieusement. <rire> C'est cette découverte fondamentale qu'actualise son livre en montrant comment des scientifiques qui perdent le sens des limites de leurs connaissances se métamorphosent, se métamorphosent immanquablement en théologie. Ils sont d'autant plus euh, enclins à le faire qu'à une époque euh, et dans une civilisation donnée, les sciences, les droits et les arts participent d'un même imaginaire, ou plus exactement de ce que Cornelius Castoriadis a nommé l'institution imaginaire de la société. On le voit bien dans l'association évoquée par Giuseppe Longo, où pour la première fois, un Boggio Lorenzetti mobilisa en 1344 la symbolique de l'infini mathématique pour représenter dans l'espace fini euh, d'une fresque l'infinité du divin. Dans ce champ d'œuvre se lit toute la puissance, mais aussi tous les risques d'un usage, usage métaphorique, c'est-à-dire au, euh, au sens premier de métaphore, un transport des symboles mathématiques hors de leur domaine. Comme celui des plantes ou animaux exotiques, un tel transport effectué sans prudence peut conduire à des contresens. Par exemple, à confondre infini mathématique et infini métaphysique, comme René Guénon, en a fait le reproche à la Nice s'agissant du calcul infinitésimal. Avant que les artistes ne se saisissent des lois de la perspective, l'image de l'au-delà ne pouvait être assujettie à un point de vue individuel qu'elle avait au contraire pour objectif de, comme, comme objet de dépasser. D'où l'ambivalence magistralement analysée par Panofsky de l'histoire de la perspective qu'on est tout, tout aussi justifié à concevoir comme un triomphe, donc c'est une citation, comme un triomphe du sens du réel, constitutif de distance et d'objectivité, que comme un triomphe de ce désir de puissance qui habite l'homme et qui nie toute distance, comme une systématisation, une stabilisation du monde extérieur, autant que comme un élargissement de la sphère du moi. Panofsky saisit ainsi un point de vue, un point de bascule historique qui a affecté d'un même pas les imaginaires artistiques, scientifiques et normatifs. À la centralité du point de, vue, de, point de vision du peintre, au correspondu le cogito cartésien dans la théorie des sciences, mais aussi la vanté souveraine du législateur dans la théorie de l'État. C'est en, en effet un siècle avant Descartes que Jean Baudin avait ordonné le domaine juridique autour de la figure d'un souverain défini par euh, sa, sa puissance absolue et perpétuelle. Cette assimilation de la souveraineté à la toute puissance a rompu euh, avec la notion de souveraineté qui prévalait chez les médiévaux et encore au Quattrocento, celle d'un garant de l'ordre d'un monde fini dans un univers infini. Ce garant étant Dieu, il ne pouvait vouloir, comme l'écrit encore Descartes au père Mersenne, changer les lois qu'il avait posées dans la nature. La création d'un monde fini régi par ses propres lois supposait en effet une autolimitation de sa toute puissance. C'est ce qui avait conduit les théologiens à distinguer la puissance absolue et la puissance ordonnée de Dieu, et les juristes, l'autorité du, euh, le, le, du souverain pontife, vicaire du Christ, et le pouvoir de l'empereur. 
C'est toute sa construction savante qui a renversé Baudin en assimilant la souveraineté à la toute-puissance et en faisant de celle-ci la clé de voûte de la théorie de l'État moderne. Ce renversement n'a cessé depuis lors de faire sentir ses effets, aussi bien dans l'histoire du droit que dans l'histoire des sciences. Contrairement au poncif selon lequel le droit serait toujours en retard sur la science, c'est un siècle avant que la place ne dise à Napoléon que Dieu avait été, était une hypothèse inutile pour comprendre l'univers, que Grossius a formulé l'hypothèse impie, euh, citation encore, de l'inexistence de Dieu pour refonder l'ordre juridique qui transcende les frontières. Cette refondation était en effet nécessaire à une époque où les guerres de religion avaient privé l'Europe de, de la commune autorité du, du souverain pontif. Et Grossius était aussi un avocat d'affaires, défendant des intérêts de la bourgeoisie flamande alors en plein essor. Pour assurer la, la paix et permettre au commerce international de se déployer librement, il lui fallait donner au droit un fondement susceptible d'être reconnu par tous, indépendamment des appartenances religieuses. Ce fondement est selon lui l'appétitus societatis, le désir de société ou sociabilité, qui serait inhérent à la nature humaine. De Grossius à la place, l'effacement progressif de la référence aux lois divines a posé à, en termes nouveaux euh, la question des rapports entre lois humaines et lois de la nature, les scientifiques étant désormais exposés au, au risque d'occuper la place et ses vacances par les théologiens. Là où ces derniers incitaient les princes à accorder le droit, euh, au, au, le, accorder le droit aux lois transcendantes révélées par l'écriture, avec un E majuscule, euh, de nombreux savants ont voulu accorder aux lois immanentes découvertes par, euh, ont voulu accorder aux droits immanentes euh, découvertes par la science. Pionniers de l'arithmétique politique, Condorcet pensait que l'humanité devait relever de lois uniformes qu'il était impossible de découvrir comme aussi qui était possible pardon, de découvrir comme autant de propositions mathématiques. Et je ne peux pas plus m'empêcher de corriger. <rire> La place dans son essai philosophique sur les probabilités ébauche les premiers algorithmes destinés à remplacer les juges par des machines à calculer. Préfaçant cet essai en 1986, René Tom observe que la charnière des 18e et 19e siècles, que la charnière des 18e et 19e siècles, les mathématiques du contrôle ont ainsi pris le pas sur les mathématiques de l'intelligibilité. Tom explique ce tournant par la professionnalisation du métier de savant, fort des certitudes de sa science, écrit-il. L'homme éclairé se mue peu à peu à ce que nous appellerions un technocrate. Mais ce que Renan, un homme d'église passé à la science, nommera l'audacieuse mais légitime pré prétention d'organiser scientifiquement la société, a été plus largement le fruit de la perte de sens des du sens des limites dont Giuseppe Longo montre les effets funestes dans tous les domaines de la recherche scientifique. Elle a eu pour corollaire l'instrumentalisation du droit et de l'État, très commun des expériences totalitaires du XXe siècle. Toutes se sont réclamées de la science pour fonder le pouvoir sans limite d'une avant-garde éclairée, organisée dans un parti unique dont l'État se devrait d'être le serviteur. Tel fut le cas de la biologie raciale et du darwinisme social dans l'Allemagne nazie, ou du socialisme scientifique en, euh, entre guillemets, en Union soviétique. En Italie même, le grand statisticien Corrado Gini, l'inventeur du célèbre coefficient du même nom, a défendu l'idée d'un despotisme éclairé par la science dans un article au titre un peu plus explicite « The scientific basis of fascism <rire> ». Dans cette logique scientiste, on est conduit à supprimer purement et simplement les facultés de droit, comme le fit le régime maoïste, adulé en son temps par tant de l'intellectuel européen, ou tout au moins à les ramener à l'état de ce qu'un au terme d'une vie largement passée au goulag, Dombrowski a nommé la faculté de l'inutile. À ceux qui croient que les so sociétés humaines et l'univers sont ainsi livrés sans cesse à l'empire des forces découvertes par la science, Simone Meveil avait objecté en 1943 que le, la force brute ce n'est pas souveraine ici-bas, elle est par nature aveugle et indéterminée. Ce qui est souverain ici-bas, c'est la détermination, la limite. Cette souveraineté de la limite a été vérifiée par la chute en moins de 15 ans de ce qui promettait d'être un Reich de Milan, puis par l'implosion du communisme réel. Elle est aujourd'hui par la montée des périls écologiques. Être incapable de s'autolimiter condamne à rencontrer sa limite catastrophique. Au sortir de la Seconde Guerre mondiale, les esprits les plus éclairés, comme Karl Polanyi, avaient, avaient pu ainsi légitimement penser qu'une autre transformation était en cours, consistant à ne plus traiter les hommes et la nature comme des objets livrés sans limite au désir de puissance, 
Euh, et il semblait qu il, que l'on ait compris la justesse de l'observation de Chesterton, selon laquelle le fou n'est pas l'homme qui a perdu la raison, mais celui qui a tout perdu, sauf la raison. Mais les noces du capitalisme et du communisme à à, à compter des réformes de Deng Xiaoping l'ont fait ressurgir partout, euh, ont fait ressurgir partout la foi scientiste en un ordre spontané dont les gouvernements ne devraient pas contrarier les lois, mais bien au contraire en faciliter la mise en œuvre. C'est une citation à la manière d'un horloger qui met de l'huile sur les rouages d'une horloge ou, d'une façon générale, veille au respect des conditions de bon fonctionnement d'un mécanisme. C'est une citation d'Ayek. Né de ce mariage, le, la gouvernance par les nombres est le dernier avatar du scientisme, c'est-à-dire de la dénaturation de la science, dans ce que Grothendieck a décrit comme une nouvelle église universelle, reposant sur un corpus dogmatique soustrait à tout débat. Dans un petit livre très stimulant, le physicien Pablo Janssen a montré que l'intelligence artificielle et le niveau libéralisme ont procédé de la, de la même foi en un ordre spontané, dont les humains seraient le, les instruments sur lesquels ils n'auraient pas de prise. Dès les années 30, la proximité de Simone de Veil avec son frère André et ses amis du, du groupe Bourbaki l'avait sensibilisé à l'émergence de l'algorithmique. Elle avait compris que le terrorisme reposait sur une vision déjà dépassée de la science et prévu les ravages que pourraient causer les, euh, les derniers développements de l'algorithmique, qu'elle nomme algèbre au sens large, et qui substitue le signe au signifié et pousse à concevoir la pensée elle-même sur le modèle de l'outil. Ainsi, ainsi que l'a noté Laurent Laforgue dans le beau texte qu'il a consacré à Simone Veil et les mathématiques, on trouve dans ses cahiers deux définitions du mot algèbre, la première étant mise au parallèle, en parallèle avec le travail moderne et la seconde avec les nouvelles machines. Travail moderne, substitution de la, du moyen à la fin, algèbre moderne, substitution du signe au signifié. Machine, la méthode se trouve dans la chose, non dans l'esprit. Algèbre, la méthode se trouve dans les signes, non dans l'esprit. Cette analogie du machinisme et de l'algorithmique, qu'elle étend quelques, pas, quelques pages plus loin à l'argent, la conduisait à prédire la réification, aujourd'hui en cours, des tâches intellectuelles qui avaient échappé à la rationalisation taylorienne du travail. Bien sûr, ce nouvel avatar du scientisme est condamné, comme tous les précédents, à rencontrer sa limite catastrophique sous la forme déjà évidente du saccage de la planète et des violences engendrées par la remontée vertigineuse des, des injustices sociales. La grande force du livre de Giuseppe Longo est de saisir ces, ces phénomènes à leurs racines épistémologiques qu'il situe en ces termes « Le modèle de la reconstruction alphabétique discrète et élémentaire du champ continu du langage » gouverne depuis des, depuis des millénaires notre science avec une extraordinaire productivité. Nous voulons tout comprendre de cette manière-là, en décomposant le monde en signes atomisés, comme nous avons atomisé, discrétisé par l'alphabet le langage, ce champ continu des humains. S'appuyant notamment sur les travaux d'Anna Soto et Carlos Sunshine sur le cancer, il nous montre comment ce modèle alphanumérique a engagé la biologie et la médecine dans des impasses en conduisant à simuler des organismes vivants à des machines computationnelles programmé et programmable. C'est le tout génétique dont André Pichot a retracé l'histoire en biologie et où Giuseppe Longo voit un dogme central selon lequel tout phénotype a son antécédent dans le génotype. On a ainsi négligé le premier principe de l'évolution mise en lumière par Darwin, celui de la reproduction avec modification. Ces errements ne se limitent pas à la biologie, mais s'étendent à la conduite des hommes et des sociétés. Comme l'avait prévu Simone Veil, les progrès prodigieux de l'informatique conduisent aujourd'hui à étendre le paradigme de la machine à la pensée elle-même. Une telle extension procède d'une improbité intellectuelle implacablement démontée par Giuseppe Longo. Il est facile d'assimiler le cerveau animal aux réseaux neuronaux multicouches qui ont conféré à l'intelligence artificielle l'extraordinaire puissance qu'elle a acquise de nos jours. Non seulement il n'y a pas d'émergence de la pensée dans les machines à état discret, mais leur efficacité est seulement basée sur une manipulation de signes indépendamment du sens. Dès lors, nous prévient-il, l'insensé, l'absurde quête tout formalisme pur, tout calcul machinal, l'évocation du sens participe toujours de, la construction toujours de la construction mathématiquement rigoureuse. Celle-ci, a posteriori, doit expliciter avec rigueur les hypothèses de travail, les définitions, les notions, les outils conceptuels, Bref, si nécessaire, le cadre axiomatique, mais censé de la praxis mathématique. L'accent mis ici par Giuseppe Longo sur l'importance cruciale d'une axiomatique, 
comme son rappel constant aux contraintes de la définition d'un espace de phase ou d'un observable, ont de forts échos dans l'ordre institutionnel. Elle éclaire aussi bien les impasses d'un universalisme en surplomb que celle du positivisme juridique lorsqu'il prétend évacuer toute considération de la ratio legis. La redécouverte médiévale du droit romain, considérée comme ratio scripta, a ouvert la voie à cet enfermement autoréférentiel dans ce qui aspirait à devenir une mathématique du social, ordonnant les relations entre des sujets de droit réduits à leur ordinal, primus, secondus, etc. Or, l'humanité ne peut être réduite à une poussière de particules contractantes mues par le calcul de leur utilité individuelle, comme le pensent encore les prophètes de la globalisation. Un tel aplatissement du monde conduit à une quête de sens qui ne trouve plus aujourd'hui à se satisfaire que dans les poussées identitaires de tout acabit. Pour, ce que la révolution numérique, pour que la révolution numérique ne conduise pas à une perte de sens radicale, elle doit être humanisée, mise au service de fins délibérées dans de multiples assemblées de parole et à, toutes, à tous les échelons économiques et politiques de la vie humaine. Yes, I wanted to add a little bit because uh, Shipio's text is a bit shorter than his time slot. So I wanted to add a bit, little bit on uh, the relationship between uh, Anasotos and uh, the humanities. So first, with uh, a little bit of uh, a joke that is not a joke, that is to say, uh, to my knowledge, Anasoto is the only uh, biologist who, who um, is a, a lab director and who goes into philosophy archives, notably Canguilhem's archive, uh, in uh, Centre Cavriès, and in Cafés, in, in UNS. Um, and it's also, uh, I, uh, we mentioned that actually yesterday, but it's an illustration of uh, uh, the intellectual commitment of Anna towards the humanities, and not uh, just, uh, let's say, utilitarian use of philosophy to solve some biological problems. Uh, but the, the thing that I wanted to discuss a bit is, um, is uh, the relationship uh, uh, between um, Bernard Stiegler, who died in uh, 2020, and, uh, and Anna Soto. Um, and I, actually, the last round table is inspired by this relationship and the one with uh, Giuseppe Longo. So here I will focus uh, on the last uh, round table is entitled Taking Care of the Biosphere. But, um, but I wanted to focus on a different question, uh, which is um, actually here a question, uh, problem that we have met a lot in our work in theoretical biology, that is to say the difficulty to engage in a theoretical debate. Um, and this is related to what Bernard Stiegler uh, uh, called proletarianization. So what is proletarianization for Stiegler? It comes from Marx, obviously, and uh, it came from something that Mas Marx described very well, but in a sense it's also in Adam Smith, so it's not a, it's a more philosophical uh, uh, description or uh, part of social sciences too. Uh, so, so the phenomenon of proletarianization um, came about in, in Marx, reinterpreted by, uh, by uh, Stiegler, when knowledge is transferred from the practitioner, uh, let's say the craftsman, to the technological apparatus. So initially it was, um, the, what is in English, la chaîne de production. Uh, so, for example, in the, in the needle factory in Adam Smith, so when the tasks are decomposed. And in this case, what happens so is that the knowledge is pushed into the technological apparatus, and the workers lose progressively their knowledge because they don't have to have it, and they don't use it anymore. So this phenomenon of proletarianization uh, was um, let's say, reworked by Stiegler and generalized 
Uh, first, as a proletarianization of consumers, and not just workers. For example, when we buy dishes that are already made in the supermarket, we no longer cook by yourself. And it's uh, the agro-industry that does the cooking. So we lose progressively the knowledge to cook and to pick ingredients and so on. So it's something very, very practical. And this proletarianization, uh, it's actually very close to the text in, uh, in, uh, of uh, Alain Supio and, um, and what Simon Veil describes, that is to say, this proletarianization extends to other fields, including scientists themselves. So uh, classical proletarianization of biologists is the use of statistical tests. In basically all uh, experimental work in biology, there are some stat statistical tests that are used to assess whether the results are by chance or not. But often this use of statistical tests is just by pushing buttons on a computer without knowing what the computer does as computation. Not from an advanced technological thing, but just from a conceptual and mathematical point of view. So that's a basic uh, proletarianization. But Anna wanted to, um, to add uh, something a bit new uh, in, in this concept, in a paper with, uh, with uh, Carlos Solenshan. And what she adds is uh, the notion that the view that biologists uh, acquired, let's say, uh, in the second part of the 20th century that living beings are machines, a machine with very simple functioning, uh, the so-called mechanisms of molecular biology, uh, led them also to proletarianize themselves. So here it's, in uh, Anna's uh, article, it's also the view of living beings as a technological object, in a sense, as a machine, uh, that is uh, conducive to the proletarianization that justifies the decomposition of tasks. So basically, 50 years ago, to make a career in biology, you had to choose a molecule to study. And this way, everybody had his own field without too much conflicts and interaction. And it was really a, it's a strategy of production of knowledge. Uh, but that was based on the idea that living beings, organisms were machines. And th that led also to the prioritization of biology themselves. And the problem now is to, um, now that the limitations are very clear, and Alberto said in the beginning <coughs> that we should take more seriously the output of molecular biology, that is to say the contradictions, the interesting things that pop out from it. But biologists are no longer able to, because they are prioritized, so they cannot think theoretically. So, the, the challenge that we face when developing a theory of organism is not just to develop a theory of organism, but it's also to overcome this loss of theoretical knowledge, this loss of theoretical practices in biology, and in a sense it's even a greater challenge than to theorize uh, organisms themselves. So it's Anna's contribution to social science <laughs> too. <laughs> Thank you. So, if you have some questions, then it's open for discussion. Alberto, Alberto, how can you? No, no, you applaud. Some questions from the audience. Uh, if I may, I will say something. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ah, well, so sorry, I had the effort. No, no, no. In fact, in fact, it was an applause. Was I have not some, raising some, my hand. I have some problems yeah. with the, the machine, yeah. you know, machine right. for me. <laughs> some kind of devil. So, <laughs> <laughs> so speak, please. No, no. I, I was. Uh, I, I wanted to, to thank Mael for this remark concerning my own uh, observation, and 
which uh, answers also what I asked yesterday about the question how to make uh, not not uh, simply people but colleagues and scientists more aware students especially young students aware of uh, endocrine disruptors and alternative theory, theory of cancer and so on and so forth. And, and Anna answered, uh, well, it's, uh, it's not th simply a matter of writing books or, or articles, but, but to change. Uh... Mm. And so my, my question is, uh, okay, given this situation and given probably the fact that it will take time, uh, what can we do? How can we act? <laughs> just to, to, to overcome this loss. Well, uh, I think uh, that uh, I gain a lot of hope since I'm sharing. It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. It works? Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, when uh, I, I gain a lot of hope since I've been asked to chair this small group, it's a, a, a network of uh, activities that the RGT, Association des Amis de Greta Thunberg, because really uh, I now met so many young people all together uh, with such an honest and commitment, interest in uh, in common aims, in constructing possible activities, both on intellectual ground and thinking, working together, and then trying to connect also on, uh, on action in some cases, which is particularly difficult. And that's really for me a gain of a perspective. I mean, we can do something, but the first thing which has to change is the way of working together. I mean. Uh, the attitude of total uh, reciprocal intellectual honesty. Well, of course, we are all honest people, I mean, you know, what's in a class, but it's not the same atmosphere as we have in a, in a university classroom. It is much more collaborative and, and with, with a, 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 a attention to the others and, and trying to, to be clear, which is the first methodological step toward uh, moving towards the world to, to reform, that's the action to do. And then the other organization, which Angelica is one of the promoters, Angelica Gilbert, uh, which is a network, is the network of, uh, European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility, that's, uh, um, we started some 15 years ago a, a, about a fight in Europe against GMOs, essentially won, with 20% of exception in Portugal, Spain, and Romania, Romania I think. Um, essentially won, and these people are just fantastic. Again, again, they are together just to understand and act together. And, and, and this network is a fantastic support, first on the psychological ground, because it's hard to imagine, which is the aggression our colleagues are submitted when they witness, for example, in European institutions about the effect of uh, pesticide or whatsoever. Barbara Domenix knows this very well for a fight concerning thyroid cancer. Uh, the aggression they are submitted to. So these networks, first of all, is a psychological support, then a bibliographic support. I mean, you know, sometimes you have someone asking, what does glyphosate do uh, to tomatoes or <laughs> just to, to, to invent something? And the network provides, in a few minutes, a bunch of references uh, uh, telling what's happening. Uh, and so, about everything, uh, I think we are, we are really constructing uh, alternative mode of uh, 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 constructing way to be together, of uh, reacting. Uh, and, and these two structures, where I'm just a component, uh, are, are, are just fantastic. Yes. Um, 
Yes. Thank you very much for this. Uh, I agree with this collaboration that I will try to make things clear, as Giuseppe said just now. But thank you for this text of Alain Supio. Uh, I share, uh, Mael, your, your, your commentary. It's beautiful. I was very sensitive to the reference to Nicolas de Cuse uh, about the, the limit and the infinity. I think it's uh, something that is, has to do with uh, the computation, the limit too. Um, and uh, I will follow this, uh, uh, this paradigm with a pro proletarization. Sorry. And uh, there is also uh, this comparison with Marx, with proletarization in economy. As everything is reproductible uh, very quickly, then the value is disappearing. And that is a limit of the economy today. And we uh, saw some uh, companies that are facing a uh, very, uh, uh, very challenging situation now uh, in economy. Then we can hope that this crisis of economy in a pharmaceutical company will lead to new organization. background, but I don't know how to do it exactly, um, how to connect more, maybe more technically, um, this, uh, this question of uh, syntactic and semantic on the one side, and constraints and the chi symbol on okay. the other. Yeah. Uh, so in a sense, maybe it's more symmetric, the relation between constraints and um, and the case symbol because the case symbol, because it's an articulation between two epistemologies. So in, in, a, in a sense they are on the same footing. Um, but in any case, it's clear to me that there are similarities uh, between the two uh, the two things, especially because um, because um, constraints and more generally relational epistemology is about detaching, it's about writing and something where the syntax, or maybe not just the syntax, but the mathematics that use also the syntax, so it's not necessarily just writing. Um, so can be detached from the phenomenon, whereas the symbol, it's really a symbol in the sense that there is reference to a concrete object that is designated, labeled, and so on or uh, the specific strain and so on. So it's uh, really about uh, reference to the outside world. So it's, there are clearly uh, relations and it's not just a random event stance, of course, because <laughs> it comes from the work with Giuseppe, but, um, but uh, uh, I think there could be links uh, forwards. Yeah, yeah, I think so too, but we have to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> So long, just a quick question. Thank you for a beautiful uh, presentation. And uh, what you say on the digitalization of law, and I, I guess it could be applied also in to other domains, for instance, medicine, yeah. diagnostic in medicine. Yeah, yeah of course. Maybe, maybe, maybe tomorrow governance in politics. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, the problem with digitization so it's, it can be generalized. It's, oh, it's a real, it's a real in, yeah. in a it's serious a, problem. In a way, it's a problem. It's already here. So, yeah, I, I would just answer her. Well, I you agree. Take, for instance, some, some transhumanist uh, proposition concerning governance. Yeah, of course. course. This way. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what I said about law is it, just a. Uh, the case between many others uh, which is at stake is, is precisely this 
context-free use of, uh, of um, digital processes that, that are problematic in, in many respects and in many areas. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions or remarks from the audience? No, I just wanted, I just wanted to see, say that all this is already here, is in medical diagnosis, and that is part of the proletarization. You don't know anymore, I mean, if you use all these aids, what is inside, because it's proprietary. And also, uh, the physician loses uh, uh, an idea of what his job is, the computer is doing that. And that is, that is wrong. Okay, and that, and in in the case of the legal case in, in the states, so you will determine, uh, for example, how many years you should give to someone that is, uh, say, uh, committed some sort of crime, by looking at the zip code of where he lives. Yeah. So guess if you are pu poor, minority in the sense of color, etc., race, etc. You are going to get a ton of years compared to someone that lives in a seventh uh, uh, in this Mount de Paris. Okay, so it's uh, it's terrible because it's so obvious that it's wrong, and yet it's being pushed by many reasons, and one of them is that uh, economic. Uh, you are saving time, and also the bias of the physician and uh, the judge, which means the bias that come with the, using a brain instead of. Uh, an algorithm. Yeah, you are uh, referring to a scandal uh, about uh, uh, software called Compass, yeah. which was yeah using 134 features uh, to um, to release people. It's you know when you're on parole, uh, yes. you're, you're, you're you're supposed to to be scanned by this uh, yeah. this uh, software, and and after a while uh, in the U.S. Um, they recognize that all the um, uh, African American would stay in jail and all the white people were, would go out. So there was obviously something wrong. And uh, in fact, uh, the company said that, that it was not racist uh, as such, but I mean, the list of features was, was made in such a way that of course, if you live in a poor area, so you know, your zip code, all the people that you are supposed to meet, uh, of course, you, you are more dangerous in some kind of way, and uh, and that's that's yeah that's exactly what, what you've been describing. So that was a big scandal. The, the thing is that uh, I also know from sociologists of, of low courts in in the U.S. that uh, judges were in some states it was mandatory to use this software, but the judges would say, of course I say I use it, but I don't, I don't because you know the dignity. Uh, of my job goes against that. Yes. So you have also have to take into account the fact that at, at a you know practical level, people are not so crazy as what you might think. <laughs> no, but apparently there are several problems out, out there, and I have heard several alarms. This was the most scandalous one, yeah. but there are others, and in medicine is everywhere. Not only is everywhere, but this uh, disdain for everything that is not modern, computerized, etc. got to the point that during COVID it's true that if you are a physician and you use a stethoscope you can get con contagion just because we didn't have the mask, etc. etc. But people uh, start not to use the stethoscope and it's indispensable. You cannot replace it by ultrasound or anything of that sort. To the point that some old physician published a paper about how you make a stethoscope with a cylinder of, you know, the ones that are in a paper towel, that are the, you know, the, the paper is, uh, is rolled on it. So you can make a disposable stethoscope because you cannot diagnose, actually. Yeah, yeah. Thank, I mean, it's as old as 200 and some years old, thanks to the neck, but it's yeah, still yeah. a very important tool that cannot be supplanted with a lot of new technology. So that is where yeah. uh, we, one of the many reasons we are in trouble. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, digital society is like you know, avoidance. You avoid direct contact mm -hmm. uh, and avoid, of course, contact with bodies mm -hmm. and, and, and speaking bodies. Of mm -hmm. course. So you don't listen to people. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's exactly <laughs> what you described.
<laughs> Brave new world. <laughs> I would like to add that I love this idea that uh, Giuseppe is also a man of the Renaissance, and uh, I, I also I enjoyed so much his papers with his daughter because I I love uh, uh, Renaissance as well, but uh, I thought that uh, this uh, working on on uh, infinity uh, inspired me to insist that in a common paper about the need of theory we illustrate the. Uh, um, pre-existent of a phase space by using an annunciation by Simone Martini. A question? Yes. I also agree that uh, Giuseppe is a man of the Renaissance <laughs> in many ways. Um, just a few words about uh, the last things that were said. Um, I'm have been recently been um, particularly traumatized by a lecture on TikTok in the medical uh, world. So it's not only about proletarization, it's beyond proletarization, because not only uh, medical doctors are now spending half of their time on TikTok, uh, but they are, mm, how can I say, diffusing um, the narrative of the pathology. So there is a form that is circular here that tries to um, get in possession again of some writing. Uh, from the part, it, all this is obviously not uh, thought by anybody, it's just happening, it's just uh, in front of us in that uh, this um, writing of uh, a known uh, humanity is going on in a total anarchic way, but it can be read by others who look at TikTok, you see? So, I wanted to say it's true, uh, the, the evolution is towards a proletarization, but there is a counter-movement that is implicit in this technological evolution that allows eventually to reintroduce a writing of a different sort. Just, I just propose it to a discussion. There are always counter movements in biology, it's uh, normativity in the sense of Canguilhem, in a sense. Yes, yes. But uh, the, the issue with uh, technologies for humans, so digital technologies, but also technologies in general, combustion engine, um, the chemical industry with respect to endocrine disruptor and so on, is that uh, the novelty always disrupts even the normative attempts, when they are possible, sometimes they are not possible, and uh, species go instinct massively, but uh, sometimes they are, the normativity is possible, but it also gets disrupted, or it's mm -hmm. not enough uh, due to the accumulation of disruptions. Mm -hmm. So here I'm talking at the same time, mm -hmm. the biological and social level. Yeah, but they are mixing up. Yes, yes. Interestingly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but uh, maybe that's the next uh, session.